Welcome, welcome to the Calling All Patriots conference call for March Q, 2021. That is March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, this fine 2021 that we are in. We're going to start with our oath, as we always do, and then we're going to move right into our prayer. We're going to open up um, to the topic at hand. The name of our um, the name of our call tonight and our piece this week is unobstructing the revelationary. And uh, I am really excited to be here with you guys tonight. And what a lovely, what a lovely uh, clover day it is. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the citizenry of which I have been so blessed with. So help me God. Where we go one, we go all. Dear God, we are so thankful to be here on the planet at this time, at these coordinates, with those around us whom we have fostered in the orchard of your free will, and our calibration to your will and learning just how valuable our experience is that we have in being in collaboration with you for our miracles. This is a time where we are in a point in history that is absolutely phenomenal and that we have actually entered into the mental equivalence and the availability of ourselves to the beautiful work that you have put before us and the beautiful work that we are. We are made from you, God. We are made from everything that you have created as life. We know there is no separation between ourselves and you and each other. There's no such thing. And so as we come into that and come from that into our lives and into the situations around us and in our interactions with each other, we fully understand that that truly is the starting point and the ending point. You are the Alpha and the Omega. And there is nothing else. There is nothing else. And anything that we get distracted with, anything that we have created that perhaps we mistake for the creator. We know that it is simply an expression, one expression of everything that you've bestowed upon us and one expression of that which we actually are. Dear God, we are in such gratitude for our lives and for our mystery, I guess, the mystery of our healing putting right that which is perhaps misaligned in our understanding. And we understand that as we become adjusted in our thinking, that we see more and more that there is nothing missing, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong at all. And those who have mistaken the creation for the Creator and those who have maligned their purpose in life to that which is dark and not of that which you are bestowing upon us as the the kingdom that we are so happy to receive and you are so glad to give to us, that even those things that they've created and they've done, that those are not able to damage us, to change Anything about who we are, no matter what thing they create, nothing can damage us. We are in your keeping. 
And even as we leave this life, that is this compilation and configuration of who we are, we know that there is nowhere that is home except you. Dear God, we pray and um, we ask that you pay special attention to those who are suffering and to create a way, perhaps, or truly communicate, I guess, with those who are looking to have you as the light at the end of their tunnel and to remind all of us that when we are not suffering and when we are, you love us the same and that you are just as available to us in either way, in either time, in any way and any place. There's nowhere that we can be that you are not there with us. Dear God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who became the perfect answer for all of our prayers and who was so willing to come and be that perfect sacrificial lamb for us and to um, create a way for us to connect to the humanness that we are and to bring the Holy Spirit and your will through this lens of humanity so that all could see and all could see how it is possible and it indeed is our purpose that we let that light shine out and refract and reflect to each other. We know that we are born with all the love we are ever going to get. And so in that, what we understand is that there is no lack. And as we experience our own love more and more, we understand that that love is your love and that we are one and we are individual expressions of the one, just as Jesus Christ is an expression of you. And we pray that we become more and more available and that we stay in our our availability, no matter what it looks like around us. We know that the straight and narrow is actually there for us to witness everything on either side that we are being protected from every single day. Dear God, we pray all these things. We ask all these things. We come before you in humility and in our humbleness because we know that as you know every single hair on our head and you know every single part of our heart, that there is no hiding from you and that there is no being hidden from you. And so we are here for your will and we are here to be that which you created us and designed us to be. We thank you for all these things and we pray all these things through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Well, welcome, welcome. I am so pleased that everyone is here tonight. I, um, you know, I, I absolutely, as most people know about me, I'm, um, I don't know what you would call it. It's an Ireland, I'm an Ireland uh, uh, ophile, I guess, uh, something like that. Um, and <clears throat> I often pull things out from my travels to Ireland um, today and pretty much all week. This is the time of year that is, it just seems so perfect for this day to be um, St. Patrick's Day in this time of our early, early spring. Um, I woke up the other night and opened the window and I could just smell the freshness and the growth of everything that was starting to happen, just barely starting to happen, starting to sprout. And uh, I had to record myself um, talking about it because I didn't want to forget it and being... um, Blind as a bat, I didn't have my glasses, so uh, recording is much quicker, and that way I don't have to write it, everything down. But I did record something about that that uh, night that I woke up because it really did come to me just how uh, youth is, and when we remember sometimes our youth and having grown up in in areas or having been. Um, uh, I'd say present to our youth when we were young. I, that's kind of sometimes I wasn't present to my youth when I was young, but there were times when I was, and to really enjoy uh, that that physicality of the regenerative and to be in the pulse of what it is that that you were growing into. And when I got off that breeze and uh, and and the feeling of freshness and the green 
uh, was that indeed the youth in us is never gone. It is, it's never gone. And that this, um, this uh, developing of, of who we are in this lifetime and the ways in which we uh, create things and the vessel that we are in at this time as it begins to be uh, something that can no longer hold us in the end. It is always something to revisit this time of year and to revisit these ideas uh, of Ireland and um, and the ways in which our youth is always always there. It's always in us and it, because it's life. That's really what life is. And the ideas that we are in our peak or we're off of our peak or we're past our peak or we're not quite at our peak, these are all just, these are markers for, I'm not sure who came up with that, but there's really nothing, that's not even, that's not true. We are always at the peak of what we are developing and who we are. And that is because this pulse of life, this way in which life courses through us, and the way that we course through life, which is is incredible that we are here experiencing this, um, is never something that is life never gets old. It's not. It doesn't age. It doesn't die. And thus, when we consider ourselves aging or dying or becoming that which is uh, an invalid, invalid, um, having um, some ways in which we are. Um, compromised, I guess, physically, that these are all markers of the, t- the chronological time that we think is real. Uh, and also it is a marker for that which reminds us again and again that the youth that we are inside and in life is never gone. It's never, it never perishes. I mean, you know, like millions, billions of people have died over the course of human history. Um, and yet what we know is that that uh, as many people that die or were killed, that you cannot kill life. You cannot do that. There's no, there's no, there's no doing that. And in fact, the definition of life, which uh, so many would like to kind of expound upon that um, when discussing what one should eat, what one shouldn't eat, uh, what one should consider to be a sentient being uh, and not, um, and those who have uh, practiced quite a bit of genocide uh, on our planet, uh, different uh, different people, different organizations, uh, who are claiming that this isn't really human, that's not really human, well, that's not really a valid human, or that's not a human that we want to have pr- reproduce because those are inferior humans, which aren't really humans, they're not really quite human. That all of these ways in which there are claims and bona fides and things that people think they're going to stamp on our humanity and say this is a, a bona fide human um, is simply uh, an assessment by a human that has no clue what God thinks, what God does, and how we were even created. In fact, I will say that sometimes when I hear people say they are healers, oh, there's healers and they do healing work and they, they're healers. I don't believe that there are healers in the world. I don't believe anybody's a healer. I don't believe I'm a healer. I don't believe anybody heals anything. Because I think that what happens is is that people forget putting the creation above the creator that actually our bodies have been encoded. They have been created and designed so that as we unobstruct them, as we perhaps unobstruct the process of a wound healing, that we aren't doing anything to heal that wound. No doctor, no um, naturopath, no nutritionist, no chiropractor, no homeopath. None of those people, none of the people that are outside of our body, not even our own intellectual properties, are healing that wound that we might sustain. Our bodies have that, in, that, that genetic encoding, that intrinsic eternal wisdom, that as long as we do not further pollute or obstruct the wound in any way, that it itself will heal perfectly. And so in, in a similar way, the name of our talk tonight, our chat, our call, which is Unobstructing the Revelationary, um, is quite, it's, it's just on point about that. And when that title came to me, I, I, I kind of, struggled a little bit with what this would would be called, but then it just came. And that is because 
there's so much of um, there's so much intention, there's so much attention that is being placed upon revolting. We must revolt. We must fight. We must we must uh, you know stand up and and take our place and and fight everything. And and truly, that is not uh, at this point. That is no longer. Not only is it not necessary, but it's not even advisable, because when when one is fighting continually, I, I think it was. I think it was Albert Einstein, Einstein that said um, that you cannot prepare for and prevent, you can't simultaneously prepare for and prevent war. And in a sense, that is true. Uh, but particularly, I think, in this second renaissance, as our availability and our mental equivalence has changed. I mean, think about it. This is like we've been in this six months now on this call. And from the time we began this call until now, I know that my mental equivalence has changed. It's transformed. It's become something that if you would have even asked me three months ago, do you recognize this in your brain? I would have said, um, maybe a little, but I don't think so. And six months ago, I certainly would not have um, been where I am at today. And I don't think it's a linear thing or a chronological thing or even perhaps a developmental thing or a skill level. I think it's actually the revelations that have been happening over and over and over, the revealing of the next thing, the revealing of that. And the only way that anything gets revealed further is if we pay attention to that which has been revealed. And I mean that the revelation will continue to happen, just as Second Renaissance, I believe, has always been here. The elements that make up Second Renaissance, this opportunity for all of us to understand what really is of God that will stand and what really isn't. What is the truth and what is a lie? We are so close in many, many ways in understanding so much more of what the lies actually are. And I would encourage everyone um, to perhaps consider that the only reason for the unveiling of the lie is for the revelation of the truth. I'm just going to let that sit in for a second there because... That, that just came down. So the unveiling of any lie that you get, that you see, that you hear, that you watch, that you are witness to, really the only reason for that now, the only reason that you're seeing the unveiling of a lie is so that you may then understand to shift your focus on what the revelation of the truth then is. Because in that moment of understanding when something is a lie, if you understand it's a lie, then it can't be the truth. So what is the truth? And most of the time, when you have the revelation of a lie, you actually have right next to it what the truth actually is, or else you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know the difference between, between the lie and the truth. And so what I think is really important about the revelation of the truth in not just one big sweeping way, but in the minutia of our lives, in the ways in which only we can affect what tomorrow is going to look like on the planet, in the ways in the, in the, in the very, as we've talked about, inverting the sock, pulling it in, right side out, going down to that line that they always sew in there for the toe, going all the way down into the particular sock that you have, that is your life, that is your existence, that, that are the things that you have considered to be the truth, or that you have considered to um, perhaps be helpful, or what you have considered to be beneficial to others and yourself. That going down to that line and being willing to go all the way to the very tip of the big toe and pull it, pull the sock right side out. In a moment, what you see is that you know if you are at the very tip. And when you are at the very tip, it's not that you're trapped, and it's not that that's where you should live. It's actually just the unveiling of the end of that road so that you may reveal the truth. When we say the revelation of the truth in the world and also in um, perhaps uh, our conversations, I'm finding that more and more it's important to understand what it is for you, yourself, and me, myself, ourself, for us to actually individually reveal the truth. So much of what we've been afraid of, what we've been taught to respect that is not respectable, 
it, for, uh, to to actually acknowledge that which um, is not even real. Uh, these are things that, unless we are willing to go to them and to call them what they are, we are not going to be able to see the revealed truth. And if we're just bumping around in the dark and um, fumbling around for the light switch but never really getting there, the unwillingness to actually understand that that is our responsibility. Our responsibility isn't to wait for someone else to put the light on or for someone else to do what we are here to do because we are the ones that are responsible for our lives. And I say that with the greatest joy. I say that with um, the intent on inspiring joy in you because if you are indeed responsible for your own life, then that means that you wear the crown of your own life and you own your own life. You are able then to meet God every day knowing that not only is he there to provide to you everything he's provided and everything he will provide, but that you actually know that you are co-creating this existence that you came to do with God. There is no better employer. There is no better husband or wife. There is no better sibling. There is no better uh, family member, organization, affiliation, church, pastor. There is nothing better than that. That is the true marriage. That is the wedding worth attending. Because if you do have that understanding that you are intrinsically, inextricably, and undeniably connected to God, then you can never walk this earth thinking what other, other people would have you think about yourself. You would never walk this earth thinking that you've thought of everything, and so then you must resort to whatever it is that you think you have to resort to in the sense of what it is that you used to perhaps be told and in, informed, so to speak, or instructed or threatened that you must accept as a lower existence of that that you were actually intended to have. When we go to the scriptures and we see that Jesus um, said, these things you shall do in greater, and in my Father's house there are many mansions, he didn't say every single thing that you would do, and he certainly didn't say what all the rooms were named in the mansion. What happens with that scripture, I feel, or that resonates with me, is that there is a mystery there of what, what next could be possible. Perhaps there's something in the anything kingdom of God that perhaps we didn't think of that could be possible. And when we consider that and consider that we don't, we're not in a panic, truly, because what are we panicking about when it's a farce? We're not in this moment of, I'm going to perish if I don't go back to the Praetorian Guard battle stations that I was used to doing. If we get rid of all of the busy work that is produced by the lies of this world sometimes, what we come to is a relaxed state of knowing, just knowing that we are in God's keeping. And from there, we move forward to do our work. I think it's often also been sold to, the, uh, to all of humanity, basically, that if you do enough spiritual steps, if you do enough spiritual work, if you do every day, if you work every day to not offend your Heavenly Father, which as a carbon speck, I find it very difficult that we would offend a God so great. And if you really do think you're going to offend God, then you might want to think about getting a, better, a bigger God that you consider to be God. Because to have a God so small that he would be upset by something you would think or do, to the degree that we think that, is, it's, just, it's, it's so claustrophobic, it's unbelievable. But once we understand that God is in pro-action consistently, very consistently, always, and that there is nothing that we're going to do to stop his will, then I find it very hard to believe that there's anything that we're going to do that will distract him as well. 
And in knowing that, what we understand is that it's really not necessary to get God's attention by our reactions, by our tantrums, and by our withdrawal and our, our, our um, uh, um, resentment or resistance. These are all things that are extremely childish, and that if we do them, all we are doing is creating busy work for ourselves again. And I say that because I think that, that there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of, quote, spiritual busy work that occurs in um, different arenas to keep people really busy, thinking they're getting somewhere, when really the hamster wheel is turning and turning, and the door of the hamster wheel cage is wide open. This idea of unobstructing the revelationary is it's, it's just it's so huge for me um this these concepts that are coming through for me uh and you know I'm trying my best to get them all succinctly recorded um uh, but this idea of that there is nothing wrong that there is nothing to revolt against there's nothing to uh pick up arms i mean i you know I understand there is a time to fight there is, but it's so small in comparison to the time that to the times that we would in fact spend revealing that which is there and wanting us to see it. God wants us to see the things that are the truth. And if we decide that we don't want to see what it, what the lies actually are, but we just want to see the truth all the time, well, that's going to be a difficult thing to do because what has been created on this plane on this plane of earth and humanity are the lies that we not only have bought into, that have been sold to us, that have been shoved at us, but we've actually defended the lies at times. We've actually become part of that machine in a way. And so extricating ourselves from it, you know, removing ourselves from that ideology is very, very difficult. And in fact, there are things that we may rather enjoy or find pleasurable or find important that once it is revealed that it is a lie, it is very difficult to see how to let go of something that you consider to be such an in, just an inherent part of yourself. But it is true that there is only freedom through going, going through. There's only the, the experience of your freedom. There's only the liberty that will help you get to the experience of the freedom that you are through going to the light and seeing that which may be hard to look at so that one may be able to invert and create something completely different. And we know we can do that. There's no doubt about that. If we've created all this stuff, we definitely can create something else, especially when we stop believing that the creation is higher than the creator. I was speaking to, I think I was talking to Teresa about this, but, you know, when you think of um when you think of Chanel, Coco Chanel, you know, and there's all this wonderful clothing and perfume and uh, Chanel Number no. 5, I don't wear it, but it is, it is like my favorite Chanel scent. Um, and when you think of all of the things that just Coco Chanel made, we're not talking even about Armani or Versace or um, any of the other great designers, but when you look at what she made, what you understand is that she didn't try to recreate or um, adjust uh, the human. What she did was she designed everything as well as she could around the true form of the human. And that's why her designs are so incredibly timeless, because they are designed after that which is eternal, which has been created by that which is eternal, which is God. This is something that I think it would behoove so many to remember, that even though concepts, ideas, creations, things that we um, decide are ours, um, that when we see them somewhere else, what we understand is that it is time for that. If you see, In fact, I think um, Teresa was telling me about a week ago that Gene Decode was saying something on his, uh, on his channel about um, inversion. And immediately I was like, I perked up. I was like, oh, wow. And it's amazing that this concept is now visited upon us, that we are able to actually grasp it in a, in a larger way. And perhaps 
it is visited more visibly because there are more people that are paying attention and that are um, aware and available to actually pick up on that, which is um, a very lovely revelation in this time that we're living in. Um, I I wanted to talk a little bit about the piece that I made uh, this week, and I, I did get some comments about the the remains, the human remains uh, in that um, in that video that I made, and I actually took those pictures when I was in Ireland. Um, the bones that you see, um, the remains of these people that they have put on display at the Irish National uh, Museum there in Dublin. Um, when I first went to Dublin, or when I first went to Ireland uh, years ago, many years ago, um, I had gone to the museum, and they had uh, at that time it was a it was kind of a recent thing that they had discovered this man that was in a bog, and the man was actually um, back in the Druid- Druidic times, pre-Christian invasion of Ireland. Um, there there were human sacrifices. Um, and this man apparently was a human sacrifice. And at that time, it was a great honor to, to do that. It was, I mean, that was considered to be a great honor to sacrifice for the, for the good of your tribe or your, or your village or, you know, your region. And so as they were going through this bog, they discovered this man, and they pulled him out. What was interesting about this particular discovery, this man, was that he was perfectly preserved. So when they pulled him out of the bog, his skin was was perfectly preserved. He was pink. It, it almost looked like he was alive. And within hours, because he was then exposed to the oxygen that he wasn't exposed to in the bog, he began to oxidize, and his skin started to shrivel, and he began to um, to start to look more like what you saw uh, in in the remains that you saw in the video. He was a little fuller because I think um, those remains had you know, oxidized slowly over time, and and his was a very quick process. But when I saw that at the Irish uh, National Museum, um, it it really just stuck with me. uh, Several parts of that were really uh, potent for me, um, that here was this person that was um, proud to be that sacrifice. Uh, Here was this understanding that we must sacrifice the the most precious thing that we have, which is life, in order to um, gain favor for the rest of the lives around us. And also the, um, the perfect preservation of the body through that time and only having it disintegrate or begin to, um, you know, not disintegrate, but, uh, but age immediately when it was out of the bog. What I see about the bog as well is, is all this intention because you know, when you go, when you when you travel through Ireland, as many know, you will actually see people still cutting turf, um, and out there with you know the old-fashioned way that they did it with saws, and you know people out there cutting cutting turf, uh, and then it's compressed and made into bricks, and that's pretty much what people burn in their very shallow fireplaces in their apartments and houses. Um, sometimes, sometimes they burn wood, but most of the time it's um, either it's this it's the land that they're burning. And what an interesting thing to take from the body of Ireland to sacrifice some of that in order for people to be warm, to be able to cook, to be able to um, have something to gather around and be in the hearth of the home. And in a, in a similar way, I would think at that time that that sacrifice was almost looked like looked at like that. Like this is here for all of us to to be able to be warm, to be able to to subsist. And when I went back to Ireland many years later, uh, I've been a few times, and, and when I went back uh, just a few years ago, um, I went to the National Irish Museum, and there were several. They decided to go look and see if there were others, and there were. And so what you're seeing is, is you know, the, the discoveries that they've made in the last 15 to 20 years um, of, these, of these people that were sacrificed. And um, what's interesting about that is as you look at that, there is such a, I feel like there's such a feeling of delicateness. There's a, there's a delicate sort of feeling about it, that there is a reverence about it. And what a difference that that is instead of the um, sort of the idea of it being so murderous. Uh, and I'm not saying that doesn't exist, and I'm not saying that some of these people weren't perhaps doing it against their will. But what I would say is that 
we live in such an incredible time because not only do we not, well, most of us do not do that, um, but at the same time, what we know is that the perfect Lamb of God who was sacrificed for us, that that has now relinquished us, not just from having to sacrifice animals, people, whatever, but also it has relinquished us from having to sacrifice our own, our own lives and livelihoods and that which we consider to be um, joyous for us in our work, in our love, in our homes, in the ways that we express. We do live at the pinnacle, the very pinnacle of everything that's been fought for, everything that's been died for, everything that has been sacrificed for. We live in that right now. And so in this way, we are so free. We are so free that we can actually even pretend like we're not. And I think that right there is the mark, not of, um, not of reality, but of the, the notion that we are truly free to choose whatever it is that we think we want. And that everything that we think we want, we already have it, because we are already thinking about it and recognizing it. And sometimes when we do get those things that we say that we want or that we don't do that which we say that we want and then we expect to have it, those are the moments where that lie, that lie, because there was nothing else for people to use after a while. They couldn't use the the threat of sacrificing you on a big pit. They couldn't use the the, the threat of leaving you in the woods if you broke your leg um, and you have, you know, your, your tribal chakra in yourself is very tuned into that, that if you're not part of the tribe, you're going to die in the woods. All of those things that have come to this point in history, what we understand is that those served, I guess, at a certain time. But now we live in a time where all of that has brought us forward into knowing that we are truly autonomous beings, being given the gift of our lives and being given the gift of the truth of history. I wanted to share one more story before um, I open it up and talk to you, talk to all of you um, individually on the call tonight. Um, The other uh, story I have is um, that since I was a child, I had these these visions of Ireland. I just kept having them and having them. And and eventually what happened was um, because I didn't understand what Ireland was. I didn't even know the name. Um, and I mean, I was a young child. But I started seeing pictures of Ireland in magazines. Uh, I saw a little bit of Ireland on TV. And I started to, to realize, yeah, that's the place. That's the place. I know that's where I'm from. That's, that's it right there. And for my entire childhood and in my teenagehood and up into my 20s, uh, I was obsessed about it. I mean, I just literally, like, it was always running in the background. And it wasn't until I was... Um, in my early 30s, that I actually went to Ireland the first time. And I had just found out um, a little bit before this, I think maybe a year before I went, that the Z at the end of my name, because most Cisneros people are spelled with an S at the end of their name, but the Z actually denotes Spanish, because some of our lineage is from Spain, and it also denotes Jewish, which is converso. It's a, it's a, you know, some people did convert in Spain. And so the Z denotes that. My brother told me that and I was like, whoa, that's intense. But the first time I went to Ireland, I was so driven and I didn't know anything about the land. I mean, as far as like what cities were where, I knew where Dublin was. And I was actually in Dublin for St. Patrick's Day the first time. And the next day after that, I decided I was just going to get on a train and I was going to go to Galway. I just was, I felt compelled to go across the country and I decided Galway was where I'd go. And, you know, like, Ireland is smaller than the state of Washington, and so it only takes you like maybe three and a half hours to get from the east coast of Ireland to the west coast, and that's where Galway is. And so I got off the train, I had my bags, and I was walking around. I checked them into this bed and breakfast, and I started to explore Galway, and I went by this river that was right there, and um, I just had a feeling about it. And as I was at the river... Um, this man started walking by, this older man, and I said, excuse me. He's like, yeah. And I go, is this, is this some kind of place that's special? Or is, there, is there anything about this one little place that, that, I, you know, that maybe you could tell me? Because I don't really know, but I feel like there's something here. And he said, well, across the way there, just across the river here, you can see it, is Clotta. 
and it's tiny. I mean, it, again, it's like maybe four blocks long, this little town of Clotta, where they make all the Clotta rings, or most of them. Um, and, uh, and he says, and, uh, and that's where the, the Spanish settled. And as soon as he said that, I looked at Clotta, and then I looked to the right, and I saw this, this gaggle of swans, this, this grouping of swans go under the bridge that was right to the right of me. And what's interesting is that I had found out years ago that my last name actually means keeper of the swans. And so this entire scenario and the chills I got and the, yes, I'm in the right place at the right time and I'm, I'm absolutely right here in my skin. I'm actually all here right now. That always impressed upon me. It, all, it, it, it always impressed upon me the, 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 the sort of sought after knowing that you're in the right place at the right time. And I think that we do live in that right now, every moment. It's not just that we're in the right place at the right time. It's that we are now available to actually know that in every moment. I say that freely because there are so many things that are a lie, that are a shadow of that which they're still trying to sell and get you uh, you know, upset about and um, you know, stoke the fire, uh, get people worked up about. And all of that is just shadow play. That's all it is. And so when you know that, when you, when you absolutely know, and when you consider the source of where that is from, and you know it is false, there's no need to investigate deeply because you already know it's false. Then what you are starting to actually do when you know that, and you live from knowing that, is you are starting to live the life that is aware of being at the right place at the right time, no questions asked. I'm going to go ahead and open up the call. I am so excited, like I said, to be with you here tonight. I can't think of a better way to, sp- to spend St. Patrick's Day. And, um, you know, if I could, I would um, have, you, have all of you come with me and go to Ireland together because I think it would be quite the experience. But I'm going to open up the call and see what it is that you have for, uh, for the group tonight and if you have any questions or any comments or any stories, and I know perhaps some of you have been to Ireland, so if there's something there that you want to share, please do. This is the time. Yeah, Christine, this is Phil. I think you probably just asked, answered my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, and I'm going back to, to the beginning of your uh, uh, talk today about um, your comments about lies and truth. And I'm, I'm dead serious with this question, by the way. Yes, sir. So when I hear the uh, lies coming out of O'Biden's press secretary's mouth, how do I reveal the actual truth out of what I just heard her say? Yeah, you, I think you just answered your own question. Because okay. what you know is it's a lie. And what is And so what is the truth? If you know that that's a lie, right? Yeah. then what is the truth? The truth is the opposite of that, and it's not based on the lie. So when you're trying to look at the truth, the truth is not based on the lie you just saw. The truth is based on something else, because you're never going to get a truth based off of a lie. right? It's like having a bad foundation and then trying to have a straight building. So what you know, it's a, you know that it's a lie, and what I would ask, um, perhaps this is a, um, a connective tissue thing, but at that point, when I know something's a lie, what, I, what, what really is going on is, well, what are they hiding? What are they covering up? Because that's actually the truth of, of what's going on. So, like, when they want to distract you, um, when something really big is going on, and they want to distract you away from that, and they create some kind of false flag, or they do something that's, you know, kind of kookaluka, but... Um, they just don't want you seeing what's behind the curtain. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. Um, that's where my attention goes. There's, um, let me give you this example. Um, I remember hearing this once, and I thought it was very interesting, and that is if you have a room full of people and you're having some kind of meeting, you know, whether it's a business meeting or something like that, and there are people that claim to be the leaders, and then there are people that are like truly, naturally the leaders of the group, when a very important question is asked, it has been proven over and over 
that the people will not look at the leader that is supposedly the leader. They'll look at the person who is actually naturally the leader. It's a rare thing that the, that the leader who is actually called a leader is a leader. But no one looks over there because they know that looking to, to that which they would say is the leader is a lie. So they look elsewhere. So whenever you see something that is, that is um, crazy and you know it's maybe not true or maybe this is very suspicious, the whole thing is not to look at that after you notice it, but to look almost in the opposite inverted direction because then you'll see what they're trying to hide by filling you up with a bunch of lies. Also, if you want to know the truth about the Biden administration, which we all know, it's false. Everything is false coming out of that. It's kind of like if you want to eat a steak, but then you get a thing of cotton candy, and no matter how you slice it, dice it, mix it up, look at it, you know, melt it down, it's never going to be a steak. It's always going to be cotton candy. That's the Biden administration, quote, administration. And we know that. It is a flagrantly false and, and absolutely fraudulent organization. It is not He's not our president. So anything that comes out of there, I just have no patience to even go through it and find out, like, wh what, is, what does this mean? Because it doesn't matter. All of it's a lie. And, you know, I would be even hard-pressed to say that, that Joe Biden even knows that because I think basically, even though I thought he was kind of a jerk to begin with, I still do, um, I think it's elder abuse what they're doing with him. I hope that helps. I kind of went off. Well, elder abuse, but that's okay because of all the child abuse he's per perpetrated. Yeah, I don't even think he's aware of anything anymore. I mean, um, if, it, if, if indeed that's even him, which I don't really even think it is. But, I hope I, you know, Phil, I, I really respect uh, your questions and your thoughts, and I, I really hope that helps because, um, you know, what is that saying? You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And then there's no shaming here, but... But it, in essence, like, they're just going to continue to try and shove it down your throat that you should pay attention. And the only way they can do that now is if you do. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You bet, Phil. Bye. So good to hear your voice tonight. Thank you. Anyone else tonight? Christine? Yes. Yes. Uh, Margaret. Hi. Hey, Margaret. I would like, hi, I'd like to add to that. Um, is that Phil who just asked the question? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite sayings is, the truth has a certain ring to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to really just trust ourselves that, you know, the growling dog when the bad guy comes to the door, mm -hmm. he knows. <laughs> yeah, he does. He knows. <laughs> trust our own. Yeah, we need to trust our own discernment, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't feel right. Like uh, what I've told people is, if if it's from God, then you've got it's surrounded by peace. Mm -hmm. And if it, if there's something that doesn't set right with you, it's just like this, it just feels funny. That's not from the Lord. That's that's from the lies of the enemy. Yes, cockadoodle. So, not that every piece of truth brings peace, but. But the discernment of if it's true or not, that's the part that brings me. Mm, mm -hmm. Like this this is not true or it is true. I really feel like I've developed that over the years, mm -hmm. decades. I didn't used to have it. I used to be <laughs> when I was young and naive. But um, to, just, to just kind of test yourself throughout the day of, you know, does it feel like the truth? Is, is that true? You know, be that growling dog with the bad guy at the door. Just to, trust that, you know, even without language, just, you know, we have a, dis a sense of discernment, especially if you have spiritual development and a relationship with God, and that's kind of what I go with, and mm -hmm. and that's why I get frustrated when sometimes my knowledge of the current events is discounted by people who I care about and care about me mm. because they just attack my source. And say, oh, especially typically, oh, especially the vaccine, this mutation that is not a vaccine, 
didn't feel right from the get-go. And I'm an anti-vaxxer, so I come into it already packed <laughs> with ammo against it. So that's not fair. But I was, but then every time I listened to some research, I more and more it verified it. But my gut feeling in the, from the beginning was this isn't right. Mm-hmm. And then the more I learn, the more I learn, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. It verifies it. And I even listened to a, a doctor with an accent who was a total vaccine guy. He's like, his whole career is how great vaccines are. And he's saying, don't get this thing. Mm-hmm. And and so anyway, um, that's what I do personally. But then I still get jolted. My credibility is questioned. In fact, last week's call, I thank you for that. I I wanted to talk, but I was in a catatonic emotional state mm, mm-hmm. because my partner Oh, I think we lost Margaret. Margaret? Yeah, it looks like she I don't know, somehow she maybe she got in a bad spot. Uh she'll call back in, I think. Um, okay. Phil, I was going to uh, ask you another question. Uh, I was going to ask you a question. That's right. Um, are you there, Phil? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So um, so this is a question that occur- occurred to me, uh, which is when you watch this stuff, when you hear this stuff and read this stuff, and I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying, okay, if you're, you know, um, what what do you want from it when you're watching it or hearing it or reading it? What do you what are you hoping to get? Well, hopefully, I would like to get the truth. Uh, for example, uh, what's going on down on the on our southern border? I mean, you know, I I don't know what to believe. I I believe what they're telling me is untrue. Mm-hmm. Or what I'm hearing out of the the White House press conferences is untrue. But yet, I'm finding a hard time. Finally, they think what what is really going on. And you, know, you hear bits and pieces about what's going on in some other source from other sources. Mm-hmm. I tend to believe those other sources rather than the White House. So, so what I'm really looking for is where where do we find the truth? And I just use that southern border as as an example. Mm-hmm. Where do we find the truth? What is going on on the southern border? Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's well, see that. Now that's. Um, I, I see. It, it seems to me like you're trying to. Uh, you're doing your best to get the information from where you can, but the information, of course, is tainted. And um, what I can say to you right now that might might help, might not help, uh, but is that there's you know there's there's so much happening behind the scenes that we don't know exactly how it was going. When um, you know when President Trump was actually at the White House, it was easier to, you know, to to find sources to say, oh, this is what they're doing, this is how they're, what they're doing with that, and, you know, and now that, that this is kind of like a moment of darkness in a way. In fact, uh, there's been a few people out there with remote viewing and a view, few other uh, um, um, modalities that, that they are saying that the 22nd of this month is actually going to be when we get some information and some news because uh up until then there's a lot there's just there's all sorts of like disinformation not even misinformation misinformation is when you accidentally say something and it's not true disinformation is is, is like on purpose so you can kind of count on everything you're hearing out there in the mainstream news from here until it gets cleaned up it's all disinformation and it's just there to either get you to be robotic in your acceptance of your, you know, of of, of your uh, servility, or it's there to irritate people who know that they're lying. They, they're just interested in irritating you. So what I would suggest is just to, to not watch any of that stuff. Don't I, I, for a little while now. And when the things that need to come out that are there for us to get um, really our hands around, it will come out. It does come out. And, um, you know, we're, we're starting our new show, The 3 and 2 R, on April 11th. And what I love about what we're doing is that I'm more of the philosophical overview, like let's tie it macro-micro. Uh, Laura Walker is the data. She's like all of the energetics and all that. And Phoenix is going to be reporting on world stuff and how that plays out. So these three together, it's kind of like watching all, you know, all separate shows, but together with the intention of, 
um, reporting and coming from that we are already in second renaissance. So I would just say hang on a little bit longer because we'll be pulling, I mean, I have several sources. Phoenix has way more sources than I do, and so does Laura Walker. And when that comes together, it's going to be something that you'll, you'll be able to get a lot more information than you're getting right now. Does that help you? Okay, I'll hang on. Okay, okay. <laughs> hang on, Phil. We we want you around. We want you sane, so don't let it get to you. Listen, don't worry about the turkeys because it's almost Thanksgiving. I always say that. I know. But anyway, um, anyone else who's – we're going to wait for uh, Margaret to come back in, but uh, anybody else that has something uh, this week? So um, while you guys are thinking or considering, uh, what I would say is that um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what uh, Phoenix did say to me, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Um, He did talk about uh, the the 22nd and also that there are plenty of people that are talking about um, April, I think, 6th, I believe. So we're going to start... Um, getting more information, but we're also going to start seeing the direction of where this is going uh, around that time. Uh, This, you you know, it's, I remember um, a friend of mine saying this a long time ago uh, about that, you know, it's great to have a home team and you're rooting for your home team and you're all over and you've got the jerseys and all that stuff. And, And then, like, you know, your team starts to lose. And, you're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why are they losing? No, no, no. And and while it's fun to, to root for the team when the team is, you know, supposedly winning, it's really important, it's more important, she said, to root for the team uh, when it seems like, you know, things are being lost and, and there's a little bit of uh, despair setting in or something like that. And and I think that uh, that when we are looking at this situation, that it's really important, it's important for us to keep our, you know, to keep our grit, keep our wits uh, during the, the tough times. But it's really, really important to remember these things. And, and it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, it definitely it is very challenging to me to remember these things sometimes. But when you do and you, and you really think about it, you know, this whole thing, I had a, a conversation with Laura Walker and we were talking about deserve, and I, I mentioned to her how much I don't like the word deserve because deserve is kind of like, oh, you know, I deserve, that means you don't deserve, you don't deserve, and I deserve, and then we both don't deserve. And You know, it, it kind of has like a, a, a tinge to it um, uh, of, of shame. Uh, but I think that, that really the earning of something is, is far more pervasive. And so when we look at all this and we know, you know, if we were to actually ask the question, do I deserve to be here? Do I deserve these things? Do I deserve to have a good life? Do I deserve to be happy? Do I deserve this? Well, really, if you need any proof that you deserve anything, that you deserve to be here, it's that you're here. That's all the proof you need. And so, you know, when you when you think of it that way, and that obviously, I remember one day, I was going through some financial straits, and I thought, you know, what, what am I going to do? Like, what what am I going to do now? And and then it was like, all of a sudden, it was just, God just said this in my head, and I, I'll remember this plain as day, and that is that... You're here, so obviously you're supposed to be here, and there has to be that which will support you being here. And, and that was uh, many years ago, but it, it really is true that there's that when we it's not about giving yourself up; it's about surrendering that which is not you. Let it fall away. Let these things, you know, Phil. I so appreciate what you're saying because. You know, sometimes it's so easy to get caught up, especially when it looks confusing. It's so easy to get caught up, you know, with the rest of the herd and have them kind of tell us how it is, tell us how it's going to be, tell us what we have to be afraid of, tell us all those things that are familiar, but they're not true. They're just comfortably uncomfortable, and that's not the truth of who we are anymore. This is a, this is our time. This is the time to go not towards God, but Start from God and move forwards, as Laura Walker has so eloquently talked about recently. So, 
So there's that. Uh, I think, Margaret, did you get back on? I, think, I thought I heard her. Yes, here she is. Are you there, Margaret? Are you there, Margaret? Oh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> oh, good, good. Okay. I'm glad you came back. And you were... I realized I hung up instead of hitting mute. Did you hear anything? Or I just heard you say <laughs> uh, that you're something about your, I think your partner or something. Oh, and then I hung up. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so I did, you, you did hear something. I didn't hang up right away. Right. All right. So, gosh, I, don't, I just said so much and I don't. Um, okay, so what did, how much did I say about the partner? That That's said? all you said. That's all I heard. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And I got nervous. Okay, so my partner and I, are dif- we differ in political viewpoints. Mm-hmm. And we know that. Eyes wide open, you know. And so we got through election. We got through campaigning or campaigning and then elected and then the fraud and then all the PS that went along with that and the inauguration. He even gave me a hug, a wordless hug on inauguration day, knowing it was difficult. And we just have learned to dance around the topic, not go into it, which can be, you know, sad sometimes because I would love to talk, but. It's just what has been working for us. And so, but one of the most frustrating aspects of that weird dance is that information that I get, he doesn't trust the source. Mm-hmm. And so, because it's not on mainstream, and I dig and find stuff like X-22 and Anne Reno and you and Phoenix and Laura Walker, you know, the esoteric and metaphysical stuff. So... And did I tell, did you hear me say that the truth has a certain ring to it? I started with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's kind of along those lines is like what what gives me peace with the knowing that that's true or not. I can hear a lot of information. It doesn't mean I agree with it all. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, on the topic of vaccines, I it's a, it's a hot topic with me because for years I've been skeptical of that invasion. And mm-hmm. my daughter, who's 25 and has never been injected for anything and still has a pineal gland intact because of it, will likely get the vaccine because she's in the hypnotic indoctrinization of the society we're in. And she said, don't even talk to me about it. It's just not even a topic. And so I, when I learned that it could produce infertility, and I thought, okay, I got at least tell her that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I found a sound bite. Five minutes. I said, just five minutes. Because if you decide to have a baby and you can't because you've made yourself infertile from this, I will kick myself from not at least presenting that piece, that little segment of information. And all she could do was attack the source. This doctor has been thrown off before, you know, whatever. I'm like, I don't care about the source. Just look at the information. You know, look at the information and see if that feels true. Mm. Refuse. Just just slam the door. Well, that's kind of what it's like with John. He won't listen to my, what I find. And so I was afraid he was going to get this vaccine. Mm. And so I would give him little snippets and I had to be gingerly and and tippy-toey and and he he just rolled his eyes because some of my, it's like I'm a conspiracy theorist. Well, so was Einstein for, for one thing when he proved true. But I just wanted to give him little little snippets because he has some medical background, mm-hmm. and so he tends to believe the Fauci stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it is about the society where when he was so a week ago, Tuesday, he said, oh, by the way, I've got my appointment tomorrow. And I go, for what? And he goes, the COVID vaccine. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Let me find you some more information. Let me. And I was up for all. I was up for hours digging into and trying to piece together little sound bites. I listened to an hour and a half presentation and just found two snippets. I had to time it out. And it took me a long time to because he wouldn't hear the whole thing. But I mm-hmm. just listened to this little tiny section and this little picture or a, a visual aid. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing. He went and got it. And I could hardly look at him. I could hardly, mm-hmm. I could hardly stand it. I, I just was, I couldn't believe my reaction. You know, this is the guy I'm doing life with, and mm-hmm. now I'm going to have to be his nurse when he gets mutated and 
<laughs> from, I mean, but okay, that's it too. So I, well, about my 12 year old self to be, uh, you know, like, I guess what was, I was like, why am I upset? Because I don't feel valid. I feel like I'm not credible. I feel mm. like I have as much value. I have less value than roadkill because at least with roadkill, roadkill is scavengers, but pluck at the carcass, you know. That's how dramatic I can get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I was like, and I'm just like, what about? Why am I reacting this way? And I thought, well, you know, maybe, all right, maybe then I will have another chapter. Maybe then I'll be equally yoked with a like-minded person when he dies because he, blah blah blah. So I'm just racing through it. But actually, what my solution to this dilemma was to go to God, and I know that, and I, I kind of had to allow my, rah, rah, rah. and and then I thought, okay, Lord. <laughs> It's just me and you from the get-go, and it will be at the end, and it is right now. And how will you, you know, I'm your servant, Lord, so how will you, how can I serve you? And what can I do with this? Find my peace. And so I went into a lot of prayer and shifted, and, and that's why last week's call was very good reminder. Mm-hmm. Of, I really appreciate your consistent application to tending to our spirituality through these changes. And... I feel like I've had a lot of spiritual development just doing life, mm. but it just feels, I feel bolstered. I feel like it's um, a good reminder of today's prayer, too. I mean, it's like, yes, yes, that's it. And I knew that inside, but I, I had to let my humanness react and have a temper tantrum. But, you know, it is it just boils down to what how God sees this, and I don't know, I... I, I wanted, I just like I didn't even know who to call with my angst. In fact, I, I, I started texting you mm-hmm. the next day, you know, and, and then I said, no, you're on your way to go see your sister. You need a break. I hope you had fun with your sister. Oh, so I did. We had a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. No, never, listen, uh, let me stop you there. Please, and anyone on the call, please, like, when you, when you contact me, and I've, I've talked to you, um, uh, each and every person on this call, personally. When 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 I talk to you and when we have that connection about anything, okay, this is what I want to see in the world. I want to see bonding. I want people to be available to their own love through being around other people. And even though we're not physically in the same space, this is really important. So never withhold that blessing of connection. Well, I even mm-hmm. considered to call, to text and say, can I call Ingrid or Phil or somebody from the call? Can uh-huh. you give Ingrid my number or something? I was like, I was, I, for, for many years, even though I'm very socially outgoing and mm-hmm. I don't have stage fright and I can get up there, I can be very lonely because I've been the island of misfit toys. <laughs> you know that from... <laughs> Well, I think I think you, you, have you, my, you raise a good point. You have there. my permission to. You have my permission to have my number. This is Ingrid. Oh, yeah. Please. I think what <laughs> to you. I mean, it's like yeah. yeah. I think you, I think this is a great thing that you're bringing up, Margaret. And thank you, Ingrid, because that's really important. I think what we're going to do here. This is great because see, look, this is the inversion of what you just talked about, right? So what I think could be very well that, that could very well serve all of us is to um, if if. If anyone wants to contact me and and is willing to have you know connection with the rest of the group, then I can send out uh, an email with you know people's information, whether it's just an email or a phone number or something. That way, um, as we roll through this information and as the times get a little tough, and I would say as the times get great, because we're going to be not just preparing for hard times, we're preparing for great times. Okay, um, that we be in connection with each other because. We are all kind of in, you know, we're we're coming from this mental equivalence that we want to see personified and manifested out into the world. So let's let's not just have this call every week. If we do have that availability to talk to each other, that would be great. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, or a Zoom call, we can mm-hmm. do faces, or or yeah, like a group email or a group text, or mm-hmm. cause our, it's just something because I, that community feeling and. Is that I think it's so important right now, and with like-minded people, because I, I get really tired of the misfit toy island that I can be on sometimes. Yeah, and and, and this I, is, I know that it, it's it, a different thing. It's okay. not. This isn't about uh, you know. This, this is not about 
taken away from anybody, you know, like when you contact them. This is all about, like, we are all interested in being proactive and moving forward. That is very different than just commiserating and, you know, uh, uh, misery loves company. That's not that's not the group, and I know that's not you guys. So if you do want to talk to each other and have that availability and be available, just, you know, like, uh, send me that send me that uh, on an email, and then I'll include everybody. My email for everyone, I'll let you get a pen or something, um, but my email is dj, so it's like a dj, dj222, the number 222, productions, and that's plural. So p-r-o-d-u-c-t-i-o-n-s at yahoo.com. So dj222productions at yahoo.com. And if you're okay uh, with your, you know, at least one contact, one way to contact uh, and to be available, then I think um, this network, Ingrid has been so good at being available for people. Uh, and she's been available for me when we've talked about different things and, you know, um, running stuff past her. And she's been incredibly supportive of the stuff that I'm doing um, as it, you know, relates to the group and everything. So I think that that would be great. And it would also, you know, as we roll into this um, uh, this this new time and second renaissance and what's going to happen next with our president, I think it's really important for us to actually do start knowing each other because in the new way of doing whatever we're going to do, whatever we're going to create, um, this is a great place to talk to each other and to um, to be, uh, you know, engaged in that. So, so if you do want to send me something, please do. Well, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Even just like I heard one of the talks I heard was like if you're if you're not the frequencies aren't lined up, it's like if they don't even hear you or see you, and that is how I feel sometimes because. I know that I feeling shift. I'm um, the shifting. Like I feel, I've been intuitive my whole life. My grandma taught me about. We used to play mental telepathy games when I was very, very young, mm-hmm. like a parlor game. And I just thought everybody did that with their grandmas. And so I've kind of developed that sense throughout my life. But wow, this is like the tuning forks are ringing right now. I, I feel more, more tuned in, more, more. But I'm not doing a thing with it. I don't even I don't even know who to say who to talk to about because they just roll their eyes. Oh yeah, you've been listening to the wacko stuff, you know. So mm-hmm. I just I crave. Yeah, and I think if we have that availability to each other, that that um, that our availability to that will go down naturally. Because because yeah. it's going to be around us. It's just you know not being an island. You know, being more of this integrative. It's it'll serve all of us. I think. So you guys, I'm just going to leave that out there, and you guys, whoever wants to, you know, kind of be a part of that, um, let me know, and we'll go from there. But uh, thank you so much, Margaret. I really, really okay. appreciate your input, and thank you for helping us invert that which is not going to serve us, which is just to kind of be separated in, in a sense. Okay. Well, thank you, and, and thanks for everything. I'm going to hit me with something else. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah, just real quick, Christine, yeah, could yeah. I check on the, um, Margaret's earlier comment about kind of um, the vaccine that's yeah. been going around on it? For sure. And, um, so, Margaret, were you talking about Dr. Bisher, Dr. Geert Bisher? Geert? Anyway. Yes, indeed. Was, that's the guy. He's the guy okay. who knows about he, He's a vaxxer, but he still says don't get this one. Yeah, so um, I was real excited about that um, and sent it to quite a few people this week. And just for what you called out, that A, he works in the vaccine industry. It's been his whole career, and he's still speaking out about this. And it kind of confirms my many, many of my concerns that you you can't rush science. You can't get a vaccine to market in nine months. Um, we're, we're jumping ahead. And... So if that's all people take away from that interview, that's great. But then I also got the follow-up from people this week that um, some gal, and I'm not even going to give her credit, um, got a hold of Dr. Bisher and the interviewer, the British interviewer, and they found, you know, some negative stuff on the Internet about them to try to discredit them. And I swear. Yeah, yeah, attack the source. That's the tactic. And if somebody's being attacked, it's because they're hitting the target. Mm-hmm. And I, I said to my friends, I just did a one little short paragraph summary. I said, you know what? 
It doesn't matter which side he's from. He called out concerns, and if all people listen to is some of the concerns, then I've done my duty for the week. And I swear, if somebody is digging up the source, because they can post fake negative stuff about you faster than you can even log on to your computer. So, this, you know, if I take anything from Christine's messages, is invert it. And I know, Margaret, you've talked about that. If somebody's saying it's bad, it's probably because it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, we'll yes, be- it's like That's opposite. a great point, Ingrid. And, yep. and here's one more fact that about the vaccine, too, is that, and I tried this on John before he got it, I said that insurance company, if you get, you, you, there's no recourse if you get damaged, it's too bad, mm-hmm. except for life insurance will not cover you because it's experimental. And, and it's, it's voluntary. approved by the FDA. Mm-hmm. It, it's, and, yeah, it's been yep. approved by the FDA. And I said, so then that caused me to dig. And it was really hard to find that it's well, not been approved. Can, it's been, it's been okay. very, what do they call it, authorized. Emergency, emergency authorization. authorization use. And which that is not is approval. Not about approval. 15, it's, about 15 years from approval. Because you right, it's not been approved. approved. And people didn't know that. It's like, he didn't know that after he found out after the fact because he rushed into it. But yeah, that's what people don't realize that it's not been approved. Mm-hmm. Well, and so if you read it, some vac- listeners will hear. If you read the vaccine literature, right in Moderna and Pfizer, it says there is no cure for COVID two. There, this is not FDA approved. This was approved for emergency authorization use, and um, it so it it. it Skirts around all the main points, but it's um, you can get emergency authorization use on something that's been considered a pandemic, but you can't get FDA approval without 10 years minimum of research, study, animal trials, and human trials. So you can't rush science no matter who you are and no matter what Fauci says. Can't hurry love. Right. And so, yeah, there, what, what are we going to no do with talking about rushing science? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not Russian science. And, and okay. not that we want this to time to be just about bashing this, but because we've got to look at what our role is going to be going forward. You bet. And with uh, all the tens of thousands of people who are going to really be damaged from it. Oh, I, I didn't have a reaction at all, they say, but well, it's just, it's wait a year. No. And their yeah, and their offspring aren't going to have a reaction either because will there be offspring? Yeah, That's to say it, there may not be. In fact, I I saw on Facebook a pregnant, a young, she's probably in her early thirties and has tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to have babies and miscarried. She finally has a baby. So then she posts herself on Facebook. She's like eight months, well, six, seven, eight months pregnant. I'm protecting my baby, and she's in a mask getting the mm-hmm. shot. Mm. Mm. And I just about vomited. I thought, yeah. don't you know? And I know it's not my job, but it's but I just feel so bad for people who won't hear the truth. So, well, the main thing is, is um, that as we care for ourselves, and I really count this call as a, a self care measure for me. That I, you know, this is what I came here to do: is to be, you know, in your presence and to serve people this way. And I get so much out of this, out of doing this, because, you know, it really reminds me again and again that we all have our roles and we all have our purpose here to do. We've traded in the roles for purpose. And you're right. What are, what are, we, what are we going to be doing in this new time when people, you know, pro- some people are going to be, you know, negatively affected by the vaccine and what happens with it and all that. And that's why right now it is so it is more important than ever for us to take care of ourselves, to really understand what our responsibility is to our purpose, and to not take on that which is not part of that, to let it fall away. You cannot, you, you absolutely cannot convince anybody of anything. They have to elect to come and be part of the conversation and to actually have a dialogue. So, in that way, we are learning at this time, at this point, and, you know, Margaret, you talked about your situation, that those who are not willing to talk about that stuff, it's it's really important for us to be in conversation with those that are coming 50% of the way. You cannot have conversations with people and drag them over the finish line with you. 
It's just impossible. It'll wear you out. It'll demoralize you. And the next thing you know, you're not available for those who really are up for that mental equivalency in conversation. Does that make sense to you all? Christine? Yes. Uh-huh. This is Vicki. Hey, Vicki. Uh, <laughs> um, I kind of wanted to add to that conversation mm-hmm. because I feel like um, I totally understand you know, what Margaret's saying about feeling that way because my family, um, not my immediate family, my husband and my kids are all um, like-minded like I am, but my sister and my, da- and my dad um, both – went and got the vaccine and my sister's having her daughter who has not had children get the vaccine mm. and their whole family all got the vaccine and everything. And so, um, I feel like, um, I mean, when he first, when they first went and got the vaccine, you know, I get, tried to give him everything, all the information. And you, what I've been getting is, you know, they don't, they don't even want to read it. They don't even want to, nope, they don't to, I mean, it's not, they don't even want to entertain it. So Mm -hmm. I kind of, I was really upset and I spent, you both, you all know that I spent several nights being really, or several days being, feeling very sad and Mm -hmm. depressed about it because I just lost my mom as well. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of soul searching and a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time doing some uh, um, journaling and what have you. And in my prayers, I, I kind of, you know, came full circle with the fact that we can't we can't um we can't make the decisions for them um you know they're going to do what they're going to do and but i do feel like we as a group here and i love that idea of all of us being able to uh, um talk to one another Mm -hmm. Um, i would like to also be on um, open to if anyone needs to call me on my phone number you can share my phone number with anybody okay um because I feel like that when all this stuff, after they've gotten these vaccines and down the road here, just a few short months down the road, we are all going to need each other more than ever. Yeah. Because I don't know what's going to happen to my dad. I don't know what's going to happen to my sister. Um, you know, mm-hmm. and I, they don't even know. I don't think they even think that anything's going to happen. But every every single day I call my dad now and I ask him, how how is he feeling this morning? Mm-hmm. Because I'm scared for that day when he tells me that he's not feeling right or something's going on. So um. you're absolutely right, and I think um, that's a great point. Um, to recently, I had a situation, and it was like, you know, I'm going to meet you in the places I think will work for us to meet, and I'm not going to try and meet you in the places that are not going to work. And mm-hmm. um, that's a very difficult thing to do when you really love, you know, you love your people, you love your family. Um, even if you don't love somebody because you don't know them very well or you don't, you know, you, you don't want to see people suffer. Uh, right. And so what we know is that, you know, I mean, Jesus said you will always have the poor. And I think really what he was really talking about as far as I'm concerned was you're always going to have people who are of poor mental equivalence. And sometimes they want to stay Mm -hmm. there, whether it's because they've been bullied, the societal thing, the pressure of not being an outsider, not being a, you know, outside the tribe, whatever it is, what we're not able to take all that on. I think you remember a few calls ago when I said, you know, I wish I could help every single person that I come in contact with and everybody on the call. And, And what I realized is like, I can't, I can do this and this will, maybe help people in a way, but to hold up that that place of this is the clearing when you are ready to talk or when you're ready for, you know, whatever it is that you're ready that I have in the light to share. Other than that, you know, you, you we don't, it, it's, it's a very hard life to meet people in the dark. And I just, right. like, I just won't do that anymore because it's, it's not something that I'm, Um, that I'm confident that I can be safe in, and I also don't think that it serves them because all they do then is react. Right. So I really appreciate you sharing that because, um, and you too, Margaret and Ingrid, and you guys, this this is really the point of this call. And Phil, thank you so much for saying that because these are the ways in which we are really, this is why we're here. This is why we are here. Each of us has a different purpose within this larger purpose, but 
what we're talking about right now isn't the call purpose only. It's everybody's purpose as they are in their lives, and that's the really important stuff. Otherwise, this these calls, things like this, these don't matter. This is nothing. It's like a car that nobody's going to drive. So this is really, right. really important and groundbreaking that we that we really are here to to be together and to support each other in this next time of work, good times and hard times, because it's right. all full spectrum. Nothing is isolated. Nothing. It's all full spectrum. I had one more question for you. Mm-hmm. Sure. So um, I was reading, um, and I I don't know if anyone else has heard this, but um, I was just reading an article, uh, I believe it was yesterday, that was talking about that people who and who are getting the vaccine have to after they get the vac after they get the second vaccine they have to quarantine from from uh, was it um, traveling traveling anywhere for, uh-huh. for 14 days even if you get the vaccine so hmm. that's you know and some of the other things that come up I I feel like don't these people can't they read it can't they understand that they can't they can't they just can't they and a lot of people can't because they they literally are listening to the mainstream media and they just believe vaccines and my dad voted for Trump so mm-hmm. i had a real hard time with him because he is a conservative but he mm-hmm. believes completely in the in the vaccine and he didn't do any research on it at all mm-hmm. so i gave him research i sent stuff to him they he wouldn't even read it right and that is crazy. And that tells you that this is f- way beyond, far beyond politics. This is yeah. way yeah. beyond that. And they have loosened that tooth and loosened that tooth. So when it actually came to to extract it, all they had to do was tap it. And so many people have, yeah. who live in fear around this stuff, you know, no, they're not going to read anything to the contrary because they're already overwhelmed. This is exactly where they wanted people. And so what we know is that some people, that's where they're going to be. And regardless of political affiliation, regardless of religious belief, regardless of the fact that they're extremely intelligent people, this conditioning is this pervasive. And so as we're seeing this as the toe of the sock, our job is not to try to save other people who want to remain at the end of the sock. Our job yeah. is to pull on that sock, reveal the truth, and let the chips fall where they may, and let people actually come to that light on their own because there is nothing we're going to do and if we do want to allow that clearing we cannot be busy out on the edges trying to drag people into it yeah, um exactly so i i'm just i'm just thrilled that you guys spoke up tonight because um that's really the important part of this you know i mean these ideas concepts philosophies whatever it is that i speak about that's just i mean that is you know it's Believe me, I, I think these are important concepts, but they're only as important as you guys play them out in the world and tell us about it. Right. Thank you so much, Vicki. Absolutely. Anybody else before we start to close up? Hey, Christine, this is Bev. I just wanted to uh, hey, Bev. <clears throat> reach out there and also say that I wouldn't mind my number being given out either because like you were saying i think in times right now we are at the point where we can't really drag people in anymore mm-hmm. we can drop little bread crumbs and i had to chuckle when margaret talked about the misfit toys because didn't we have a conversation <laughs> recently? we did <laughs> but yeah you know we need to help each other because what the heck it's going to be a rough rough mm-hmm. going but it's all positive and we're seeing that it's just you can't look on the outside right now. You have to look within and to God mm-hmm. and just remove that stuff because it will fall away. What is not for the greatest and highest good is going to fall away. And yeah, it's like that torna- tornado we were talking about, you know, in our conversations and also the funnel thing in the call last uh, week, which is you don't reach your hand out into the winds of the tornado. You stay in that eye of the storm. You stay in that absolute still place. Be still and know that I am God. Um because that that is really where we are going to be the strongest and we are going to be able to affect better anything that um that w- that is that people are going to be ready to accept and and learn 
No, it's kind of like that. You know, you can light one candle and it brightens up a, a room, but light 20 or 30, and they're working together to create that great of a light, and I think that's where we're at right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I I feel so blessed that we're becoming friends and that there is uh you know this is a time that um that is just it's unpre- it's unprecedented. I mean, don't be nobody beat yourself up because you don't know how to handle this time. Um because this is this is not like any other time. It really really is not. And uh it, it's it, this is it, it and it's going to it's going to get a little weird, okay? Um and that's just that's just how it's going to go. I'm uh I am going to um I wanted to let's see. Um before we take off here. Um oh, I can't find the words to this. Uh be but look it up on your own. Uh be still and know that I am God. Uh if you go on YouTube and get the Chanticleer, C H A N T I C L E E R. Uh, a version of that it is absolutely amazing and i and i want all of you to listen to that tonight because it is it is uh it really is something it is just it will completely lift you i i know people like to listen to certain music when they work out <laughs> sometimes i listen to these kind of things because they're just so beautiful um and i also wanted to leave you tonight with um the pretenders, uh, Chrissy Hind, and I'll stand by you because this is really why I'm doing this. I'm going to stand by you. I stand by what we're doing here. All right, I absolutely do. This isn't a call. This is this is a call to action. It's calling all patriots. This is a call to action that we take. So this is oh, why you look so sad? Tears are in your eyes. Come on now, come to me now. Don't be ashamed to cry. Let me see you through because I've seen the dark side too. When the night falls on you, you don't know what to do. Nothing you confess could make me love you less. I'll stand by you. I'll stand by you. Won't let nobody hurt you. So if you're mad, get mad. Don't hold it all inside. Come on, talk to me now. Hey, what do you got to hide? I get angry too. And I'm a lot like you. When you're standing at the crossroads and you don't know which which path to choose, let me come along. Because even if you're wrong, I'll stand by you. Take me in into your darkest hour. I'll never desert you. When the night falls on you, baby, when you're feeling all alone, you won't be on your own. Why? Because I'll stand by you, and I'll never desert you. won't let nobody hurt you. I'll stand by you. And that's really, I think that's a song from God to all of us. Truly. And that is how I feel. That I will stand by each and every one of you. I will. This is why I'm here. This is why we're all here. And we all do this in different ways. So, this is our stand and part of that stand is standing by each other. Well, if no one else has anything else to say tonight um, on this call, anybody? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close up with prayer, and um, and we'll be sent out into the world to be that clearing, be that, be in the middle of that light, and watch the miracles start to form, really, seriously. Dear God, dear Lord, we come before you now, and what an incredible experience this call is. What a true light in the middle of all of this this, this mayhem and shadow and crazy winds and trash cans being blown around. We know the truth, though. And we know that as you are our true home and that we're never outside of that home. We are never outside of that purview. That as we move along in the world, we take our home with us, which is you, dear God. We take you with us. And we are swept up in your love. We are swept up in everything that is there, that is you, that is life, that is everything that is the eternal youth, that this spring, that the St. Patrick's Day, that all that resonates and all that says life all the time, that this is what truly, truly is and all else is false. It's a lie. It does not warrant or merit our attention, our precious, precious blood that's coursing through our bodies and our mothers who carried us for nine months to bring us here and for everything, all of the elements, not just in, uh, not just in the creation 
of our ourselves in this particular recipe, but every single quadrant, every single moment in history that has gone on so that we are here right at this time, truly the miracle happened before we were aware of it. Thank you, dear God, for all of this and for every single person on this call. We know that every single person has their purpose that they are putting out into the world no matter who is paying attention and no matter who isn't or who is or who isn't or who is going to say something or who isn't. We know that people have a reaction to the truth and whether that, that reaction is something that we call positive or whether that reaction is something that we call negative, the truth never, ever goes away. We know this. And so we take comfort in that. We take comfort that we're in your keeping. Even as we peer over the side of your hands that we're sitting in, we know that we're in your keeping at all times. We pray for those around us who have mistaken the lie for the truth, and we know that when they come to their senses, and we know that when the clearing is there, that they will join us in that light, and they will be, there will be an even deeper appreciation and bonding between all of us and those who are still trying to make sense of the lie and the dark. Dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and such a great, the example, the example of the Holy Spirit working through the human. We are so, so very fortunate to have that example and to have that blood that has paid for everything that we know matters and that will persist and be the eternal truth as the, the lie falls away. And we stand because we are of you, God. We are of you. We thank you for all this. We pray all these things. We pray, pray, pray for those who are suffering. We pray for the shortening of their suffering and for their coming to the realization all the time that they are also in your keeping. We thank you for this. We pray all these things. We pray for our president, Donald J. Trump, and we pray all this through your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, you guys have a great night. God bless you all. And um, go ahead and email me, and I'll get you guys all connected up through the email, okay? Thank you, Christine. Blessings to all of you. Blessings, blessings to you. Amen and blessings from here, too. All right, Margaret. Happy Thank spring, you. even though I got a half a foot of snow. <laughs> Happy St. <Saint> Patrick's Day. <laughs> yeah. Good night. <laughs>